1932 elections, the Nazis became the largest party in Germany's parliament, the Reichstag. But Hitler refused to join a coalition, leaving parliament paralyzed. To break the impasse, President Hindenburg made him chancellor in January 1933, head of the government. Within a month, the Reichstag burned down. Hitler accused the communists and demanded emergency powers. He then used them to ban all other political parties. In August 1934, President Hindenburg died. Hitler declared himself president. He was now absolute leader, the Führer of Germany. In 1931, without even informing their own elected government, the Japanese forces in Manchuria seized the capital Mukde and then overran the rest of the territory. A puppet state, Manchu Kuo, was proclaimed under a puppet rule. Henry Pu Yi, the last emperor of China, who had been at its headquarters in Geneva, the League of Nations now faced its first great test. Japan was universally condemned. But her response was blunt. Japan, however, finds it impossible to accept the report adopted by the Assembly. The Japanese then just walked out, and the League suddenly realized there was nothing it could do about Manchuria. Japan was declared an international pariah, but it didn't care. In 1936, as a precursor to invasion, the Japanese signed a pact with Hitler. The aim was to guard against any attack by Soviet Russia were it to move on China. Then in July 1937, the Japanese provoked an incident with Chinese troops and invaded. It is easy to laugh at Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy. All that, by 1928, his position seemed secure. Parliament was appointed rather than elected, and all power was firmly in the hands of the fascist Grand Council. Italy's armed forces were built up, including an advanced modern air force. In the Mediterranean, Mussolini launched a powerful navy bigger than the combined might of the British and French Mediterranean fleets. When the Great Depression came, Italy seemed to weather it better than most. Mussolini became a source of worldwide inspiration. Political leaders, not least Adolf Hitler in Germany, saw the fascist system as a role model, strong and purposeful, in contrast to the weakness of the democracies in Britain and France. But Mussolini wanted more than adulation. He wanted to recreate the Roman Empire. And he already had a target in mind for his first imperial land grab. His target was Abyssinia, today's Ethiopia. Italy already had colonies on its borders in Eritrea and Italian Somaliland. It harried the Abyssinians. On occasions, dropping gas bombs, even though gas had been outlawed at Versailles as a crime against humanity. After six months, Abyssinia was completely overrun. The Emperor Haile Selassie fled into exile in Britain. From its headquarters in Switzerland, the League of Nations wrung its hands. It did impose economic sanctions, but they had little effect. Mussolini's aggression had revealed two things. The League of Nations, that great hope for peace, was impotent. And both Europe's supposed major powers, the democracies Britain and France, no longer had the stomach for a fight. Rhineland and Saleh 
but now he had a grander target in mind. His homeland... Or in the summer of 1938, he turned on his next prey, Czechoslovakia. A substantial German minority lived in the northwest of the country, an area known as the Sudetenland. So, on October the 1st, German troops occupied the Sudetenland and seized the Czech frontier fortifications. Hitler now began sizing up his next target, Poland. On August the 23rd, the Soviet Union and the Third Reich, who everyone had believed were sworn enemies, announced a non-aggression. The agreement secretly specified that Poland would be split between the two countries and Stalin would have a free hand to take over Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. During the afternoon of August 31st, 1939, German forces made their final preparations for the invasion of Poland. From the start, it went well for the Germans. The Polish Air Force was effectively eliminated within the first two days. On September the 27th, Warsaw surrendered. The next day, the victors carved Poland up according to the Nazi Soviet pact. The blitzkrieg against Poland had been a stunning success for Adolf Hitler. He had subdued an entire country in less than four weeks. On November the 30th, 1939, a new theater of war was opened up. The Soviet Union invaded its tiny neighbor, Finland. In the winter months, the only way it could get to Germany was via the Norwegian port of Narvik. If the Allies landed in Norway, this vital supply could be cut off. So he ordered plans to be prepared for an invasion of Norway. Denmark, which was in the way, would also have to be seized. The Norwegian defenders were swiftly overwhelmed. As were the Danes. German forces occupied their country within 24 hours. At dawn, a whole German airborne division parachuted into Holland to seize bridges and airfields. Simultaneously, the massive Belgian fortress of Eban Emal was assaulted. On May the 14th, the Germans demanded the surrender of the port of Rotterdam. A large force of bombers took off as the Dutch hesitated. While they were airborne, the Dutch agreed to surrender the city, but apparently a recall message never reached the bombers. Rotterdam was devastated. The Dutch capitulated the next day. At four in the morning of June the 5th, a short bombardment began the final destruction of France. Assault troops crossed the Somme and the Aisne. At first, the French resistance was fierce, and the Germans struggled to break out of their bridgeheads. But, once again, the Luftwaffe helped crush the defences. Soon the panzers were pushing south, and the trickle of surrendering French troops turned into a flood. On the 14th, the German army marched into Paris. The swastika was raised on the Eiffel Tower. Hitler had secured the prize which had eluded the Kaiser in 1914. As a French delegation entered the carriage, he handed them his terms and then left. The French insisted on consulting their government, but the next day they were told that if they didn't sign immediately, the panzers would roll again. They signed, and the humiliation of France was complete. 
Before Hitler, his control of Western Europe seemed absolute. He felt sure that Britain must now seek peace and that soon he could turn to the next stage of his master plan. Britain's situation seemed hopeless. And Hitler had no doubt that Britain would soon try to negotiate a peace. But Churchill quickly showed how determined he was prepared to be in the war against the Nazis. Goering selected August the 13th as Adlertag, Eagle Day, for the start of his main assault. His aim was to destroy RAF fighters in the air and the RAF's airfields and Britain's aircraft factories. One station on the Isle of Wight was put out of action and several were damaged, but these were working again within hours. Goering did not believe that radar had a significant role to play in the battle, and so these attacks were not repeated. It was a big mistake. The Battle of Britain did not really end, it died away. Hitler now tried a new tactic. But for Hitler, this was no more than an irritating setback. Britain, he was convinced, would never be a serious threat. So he now turned to Eastern Europe. For Britain, there was now a chance to rebuild with a view one day to taking the fight to the enemy. But to do that, Churchill would need help. And there was only one country that could provide it. The United States would supply Britain with 50 World War I destroyers in return for 99-year leases on bases in Newfoundland and the Caribbean. In January 1941, Roosevelt introduced his so-called Lend-Lease Bill. The United States would supply weapons and war material to Britain and China, which was still struggling desperately against the invading Japanese. Payment would be delayed. The US Navy also began providing limited convoy escorts, particularly for US ships carrying Lend-Lease materials. Hitler now gave his submariners strict instructions not to sink American ships, as he didn't want to provoke the United States into war. He referred to Bletchley's output as his ultra-secret information, and ultra became its codename. The need to keep the source of the intelligence secret was so great that Churchill insisted that no action could be taken on the basis of ultra-material unless a cover plan had been developed to convince the Germans that the intelligence must have come from another. The British aircraft carrier Glorious was covering the convoys with drawing Allied troops from Norway when Bletchley decoded signals showing the German battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau were approaching its position. A warning was passed to Royal Navy headquarters, but unaware of how accurate the information was likely to be, this chose not to pass it on. The Glorious was intercepted and sunk. The British Navy had learned the hard way just how important the new source of intelligence could be. It was not a mistake it would make again. On March the 4th, 1941, two commando units and a demolition squad were landed on the Lofoten Islands off northern Norway. Their main objective was to destroy... The commandos then rounded up 60 Norwegian collaborators and 225 German prisoners before returning without any losses. Churchill needed other ways to hurt, so he focused on the resistance movements in the occupied countries. Its objectives were to encourage sabotage of the enemy war effort, gather intelligence and prepare clandestine forces to disrupt German defences. As Hitler marched triumphantly across Western Europe in the early summer of 1940, 
His fellow dictator in Italy, Benito Mussolini, dreamt of a similar campaign further south. 1940, they moved in across the desert. Just four days later, they overran the Italian defences. Nearly 40,000 Italians were taken prisoner. It was the first sign that the Italian army was in poor fighting shape. As the Italian troops were now pushed back, Mussolini's Balkan ambitions fell apart. The Italians were in deep trouble. In April 1941, over half a million German troops swept down into Yugoslavia and Greece. For Germany, it would prove to be the beginning of a fateful entanglement with Mussolini's political dreams. Four months later, Britain struck again. The Italian fleet was again caught off guard off the coast of Greece. Mussolini's challenge to the British Navy was finished. Finally, on the evening of October the 23rd, 1942, the British opened up an artillery bombardment on Rommel's positions. Under cover of the bombardment, Allied engineers moved forward to clear paths through the Axis minefields. The Axis forces were harried by Allied air power. Finally, after 10 days of fighting, the Allied forces broke through. It was Germany's first major defeat at the hands of the Western Allies. The Allies' pincer closed and the Axis troops were trapped. Five days later, a quarter of a million German and Italian soldiers for the Italian people, the invasion of Sicily was the final humiliation. Mussolini was overthrown in a popular uprising. The new government now opened secret talks with the Allies for an armistice. Within five weeks, the Germans had been pushed out of Sicily. It wouldn't be until the spring of 1945 that the campaign could resume and Italy was finally won. By then, the Italians had had enough of Mussolini. He was captured by Italian partisan forces and shot. His corpse was hung by its heels in Milan. At 5 a.m. on June the 22nd, three years to the day after Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, the guns of the Red Army began a ferocious bombardment of German forces in what today is Belarus. It was exactly where, months earlier, German intelligence reports had suggested a Soviet attack would come. But because Hitler had ignored them, the area was poorly defended. It was another of his mistakes. The barrage was followed, as always, by a torrent of Soviet tanks and infantry 
crashing into the German defences. To make matters worse for the Germans, they had almost no air support. Much of the Luftwaffe was still tied up defending the German homeland. It was now that Hitler's folly of fighting a war on two fronts became all too apparent. Over a hundred thousand German troops were trapped. Within a week, the German survivors surrendered. Across the entire Eastern Front, the Germans were in retreat. On July the 23rd, 1944, Soviet forces reached the small Polish village of Majdanek, near Lublin. Here they came across their first evidence of Hitler's final solution. The Majdanek extermination camp. During 1943 and 44, several reports reached London about what was going on inside the extermination camps but nothing was done. Today, it is estimated some six million Jews were exterminated in Hitler's camps. What the Allies had never understood until the war was over was the vast scale of the Nazi extermination campaign. By the end of 1944, most of Eastern Europe lay in Stalin's grasp. His troops controlled the Baltic states and Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. Pro-Soviet forces ruled in Yugoslavia and Albania. Hungary and Czechoslovakia were in his sights. Stalin had successfully laid the foundations for the future Soviet bloc. He could now, at last, move on to Germany. Eventually, in April 1943, at an Allied conference in Washington, Churchill and the US President Franklin Roosevelt agreed upon a date. D-Day, or Operation Overlord, as a seaborne invasion of France was formally called, would take place in the summer of 1944. The Calais was clearly the favorite. It offered the shortest sea crossing, and it offered the shortest and most direct way to Germany. Operation Overlord, the greatest seaborne invasion ever, was underway. D-Day had begun. in the morning of June the 6th, 1944, British aircraft and towing gliders arrived over the coast of northern France. Then the gliders were released and plunged down to capture vital bridges over the Caen Canal in eastern Normandy. The Allies had launched their great gamble to invade Hitler's empire in Western Europe. As the second day dawned on the greatest seaborne invasion ever attempted, thousands of Allied troops had broken out of their beachheads and were moving inland. After four days of fighting, all the Allied beachheads were finally able to link up. 
its spearhead ran into four German Tiger tanks. The Allies' Sherman tanks were completely outclassed. Their guns were outranged and their shells unable to penetrate the German armor. They were particularly vulnerable because many ran on petrol fuel and were liable to burst into flames when hit. The Germans nicknamed the Sherman the Ronson after the cigarette lighter or more. They were now moving round behind the German forces, still battling it out with the British and Canadians near Caen. the Americans to their south and the British to their north, it seemed the German forces in Normandy would be surrounded. Hitler issued his usual order that there should be no retreat, but as the Allies squeezed in on them, the Germans began to flee. By the summer of 1944, Allied troops were racing towards Paris. The final phase of the war in Europe was about to be played out. The Western Allies were squeezing in on Germany through France. The Soviet Union was approaching from the east. But as the Russians now advanced into German-occupied territory, they came across the most shocking discovery in modern history. A series of camps that would call into question the very nature of humanity. The world was about to discover the true horror of the Nazi regime. Hitler was planning a new fight back. His plan? to destroy Allied morale by attacking civilian targets, particularly in Britain. His method? A new miracle weapon, the flying bomb. On June 13, 1944, ten were fired at London. Six struck home. The Germans called it Vengeance Weapon 1, the V1. The British simply called it the Doodlebug. For the next few weeks, up to a hundred Doodlebugs a day were fired at British cities from launch sites along the German-occupied Channel coast. The Germans had a second miracle weapon up their sleeves. heels of the V1 came the much more sophisticated V2 rocket. The first fell on London on September the 8th, 1944. For six months, Britain had no response. Over 1,100 V2s landed on defenseless British cities. Then, in the summer of 1944, the Polish Home Army in Warsaw rose up against its German occupiers. It was now that hostility between the two countries came to a head. The Home Army had been spurred on by a broadcast from Moscow on July the 29th, urging a popular uprising. first few days of the rising, it seized some two-thirds of the city. It had about 40,000 men and women armed mainly with captured German weapons. There were also more than 200,000 unarmed helpers. They lacked any weapons capable of repelling the German heavy armor. 
generals looked to the Soviet army, still camped just to the south, for help. But Stalin ordered it to do nothing and dismissed the Home Army's leadership as power-seeking criminals. But Stalin regarded the Polish Home Army as close to the Polish government in exile in London and hostile to communism. So he turned a blind eye to the plight of the Polish. The Germans wouldn't finally be pushed out of Poland until the Russian army drove them out in January 1945. On March the 7th, 1945, they reached the Rhine at Cologne. But Hitler had ordered all the bridges to be destroyed. Then, as the US forces explored further south, they found one bridge still intact near the small town of Remagen. They made a dash for it, brushing aside German resistance. By March 1945, the Red Army was lined up along the river Oder, awaiting a final assault on Berlin. It presented the Allied military command in the West with a dilemma. Berlin was less than 300 miles from their advanced positions. Most Allied commanders wanted to race to the city to beat the Russians. But at a conference a month earlier, in the Black Sea port of Yalta, the Allied leaders had divided up Germany into zones of influence. Berlin was firmly inside the Russian zone. So Eisenhower was instructed to tell his commanders to ignore Berlin and spread out to take the rest of the country. When, two weeks later, the area fell, more than 325,000 troops were taken prisoner. It was one of the largest number of German prisoners taken in the war so far. The German commander, the die-hard Nazi Field Marshal Walter Mödel, committed suicide. On April the 9th, 1945, British troops attacked, pulling German forces in from along the front. And on April the 29th, surrendered unconditionally. It would take effect from May the 2nd, 1945. This was the first formal surrender of German forces anywhere in Europe. On April the 1st, 1945, Josef Stalin summoned his top commanders to Moscow to receive their orders for the capture of Berlin. The next morning, on May the 1st, 1945, the event was restaged for the cameras. But by then, Hitler was already dead. On April the 30th, as fighting raged overhead, the man whose insane ambitions had embroiled the world in war laid waste a continent and led to the extermination of millions of Jews took his own life. His longtime mistress, Eva Brown, who he'd married the day before, died with him. Their partially burned bodies were buried in the garden of the Reich's Chancellor. But the fighting continued. On May the 1st, 1945, the day after his death, German people were told that their Führer had fallen in battle. But they were told to continue the fight against the Bolshevik menace. 
The next morning, Berlin surrendered. By mid-afternoon, all fighting in the city had stopped. Across the country, the pace of the German surrender now gathered momentum. At 2.41 in the morning of May the 7th, 1945, at Eisenhower's headquarters in France, General Alfred Jodl, Hitler's chief of operations throughout the six years of war, signed a document of unconditional surrender. Eisenhower's chief of staff, Walter Bedell Smith, signed for the Western Allies. General Ivan Suslaparov signed for the Soviet Union. Across Europe and the United States, crowds began to celebrate the end of the war in Europe. The day after the German surrender, May the 8th, would be known as VE Day, Victory. In the first months of 1945, Japan was on the run. The Americans had fought their way across the Pacific. US submarines and aircraft had destroyed Japan's merchant fleet and naval air power. At 5.30 in the morning of July the 16th, the atomic age began. Two days later, on August the 9th, Fat Man was dropped on the major military port of Nagasaki. plutonium bomb was even more powerful. In fact, the bomb fell way off target, but it still caused massive destruction. Between 35,000 and 50,000 people are estimated to have died in the explosion. Then, on August the 14th, Hirohito used his huge prestige to instruct the war cabinet to endure the unendurable and accept the terms. Several days later, on September the 2nd, 1945, a Japanese delegation came aboard the USS battleship Missouri. quarterdeck, the new Japanese foreign minister, Mamoru Shigemitsu, signed the document of unconditional surrender. World War II was at an end.